All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to, of course, welcome you all to the CPS Board of Education Health and Safety Committee meeting for December the 5th, 2022. I'm going to begin with a quick roll call of the committee members, and I will first start off with Vice President Jones here, and then Board Member Moffitt, and then, of course, myself. We're happy to have you all here today, especially with our legislative liaisons, Mr. Kearney and Mr. Glover. And then we will be having a presentation from Susan Shelton, and we will also have our superintendent Wright. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. As a reminder, for those of you who have tuned in virtually, the documents that we will be reviewing are available on board docs and members of the public who wish to speak, you may do so by clicking the chat button now. And the chat feature will open for three minutes. Please submit your name, your affiliation to the district, your school community, your topic and your contact information. And if you want a direct response to any questions that you might have. So up first, since we're starting with the agenda, we will um, have a presentation from our government liaisons. And I look forward to hearing some of the updates now that things have started back, of course, at the House and in Columbus. And I also look forward to hearing more about um, SB 178 as well. So the floor is yours. we um, provided a copy of that link, which was provided, I think, to all of the committee members. And then um, in, the, in terms of the legislative report, what we've done is provided you with all of the bills that have been introduced from November 1st. You will note that there are a lot of bills and a lot of what are called name or, naming or honoring bills. And that's typically what happens at the, um, during lame duck at the end of a general assembly. Um, and then uh, there's some other items of note from across the state. These are um, news and information that um, you as board members and your uh, fellow board members would be interested in. And so we put those there um, to keep you apprised of some big issues that are going on in the state of Ohio. Um, then uh, George is going to take the ball and run with it in terms of Senate bill. 178, and then we'll be ready for questions that you might have. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. You should have in front of you now a, a copy of a relevant article from the Columbus Dispatch dated December 1st, I hope. I refer that to your attention because I think it does an excellent job of outlining the complexity, the nature of the bill, Senate Bill 178, which was recently introduced in the Ohio General Assembly during the lame duck session. It appears to be a rather fast track in the Ohio Senate, at least, where we'll have a third and probably final hearing for the Senate Education Committee on Tuesday and more than likely face a full vote by the Ohio Senate on Wednesday. With the strong support of Ohio Senate President Matt Huffman, it is expected to pass the Ohio Senate on Wednesday. With respect to the governor, Governor DeWine has already indicated his public support for the bill as well. So then it comes down to the third and final person in this political equation, called the Speaker of the Ohio's, Ohio House Speaker Bob Cup. Speaker Cup has been rather non-committal on the bill at this point and said he wants to wait and see what the Senate does and then pay, perhaps take a, take a hard look at the bill. There is, the, of course, the legislative clock that's, clocking, that's going forward right now. And by that, I mean more than likely the lame duck session of Columbus will probably finish next week, probably mid-September. There is one additional day scheduled as needed for the third week in September, I'm sorry, December, December 21st, if needed. So the clock is ticking. There's rather a short time frame, but nevertheless, this bill, as complex as it is, 
with over 2,100 pages, appears to be on a fast track, at least through the House Senate, with the support of the governor and perhaps in the House. That remains to be seen. And so what is in the bill itself, I would uh, guide your attention to um, the article I presented. And I will simply give you what I consider is a rather quick and easy <coughs> oversight of the bill or summary of the bill. It would overhaul the state's Department of Education by creating the Department of Education and Workforce, the cabinet level director appointed by the governor. The redesigned agency would have two divisions, one focused on traditional K through 12, second one focusing on technical education or career tech. The divisions would each have a deputy director serving on the governor's executive workforce board. The power of the State Board of Education would also be reduced, although this current composition of the board would remain the same. As an example of that, the current superintendent under this, under this bill would no longer have the title of superintendent. In fact, would be in it, he would be a secretary to the board and be an assistant, an advisor, if you will. Clearly, this is a thrust, knowledge for everybody to better align the state boards of education policy, if that's what you want to call it, with the governor, whoever the current governor is in the state of Ohio. This has been an issue that's been fermenting in Columbus for many years now. And now with Republicans in control, with the governor reelected, the process is going forward at least through part of the Ohio General Assembly. I'm going to stop there because let you just kind of look through that article I gave you because there is a lot of information in that article to see if you have any specific questions I might respond to in the bill as introduced now. I think the only couple of questions that I have, if you could just do a quick summary for those who may be listening or who may tune into this at a later date. Um, I know that you said that they would vote on this on possibly on Wednesday. Is that what you stated? It is anticipated the Ohio Senate will pass the bill on Wednesday. We'll pass. So we're looking at this passing? Just the Ohio Senate. Okay. Then it has to go through the entire House process as well. And what would be the date on that? Well, there is no scheduled hearings at this point. However, in lame duck session, sometimes funny things happen rather quickly and behind the scenes. Right. So it really comes down to what is the position and how firm is that position of the current Speaker of the House, Bob Cup. And he has been this far publicly noncommittal. But it is significant that the governor has indicated his public support of the bill as well. In regards to what the final outcome might be in the current lame duck session, I think you can expect this bill, if it's not adopted during the lame duck session, to reemerge next year in the 135th Ohio General Assembly will be widely debated and discussed and perhaps even made part of the state's operating budget, which will be introduced early next year and by state constitution, let's be enacted by June 30th. Okay. I'm going to open it up to my other colleagues to see if they have any questions or if administration has any questions or comments. Board Member Jones. Yes, thank you. Um, just for a clarification, the way, what it would do if the department is all under the auspices of the governor and then be split into two departments. So the state superintendent's role would then that position would not be decided by the Ohio Department of Education, but rather be an appointment via the governor. Correct? That is correct. He would become okay. a secretary to the board, but also an yes. advisor. Okay. And and so I, I certainly have some issues about that. And some, I'm sure we all do. But even more importantly, I, I am aware that there are, there's a, coalition called the Honesty, uh, it, where is it? I, I have it. It's called the Honesty something. Honesty for Education. Yes. yes. And and they actually reached out to me, and this is for my colleagues, they reached out to um, actually a week or so ago to see if we would have any interest in mm -hmm. joining their coalition. So I can talk about that later. I just wanted to be clear kind of what that structurally, what that would look like. So it would give the governor the sole discretion and supervision over the department as a, as a department of the state and not necessarily a separate, a separate entity, correct? 
correct, but the State Board of Education would still remain an entity, yeah. much diminished, but still with the same number of members, still right. elected or appointed yeah. the same way. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I might, I'm sorry, go right ahead. No, my question, I was gonna just basically summarize what uh, Board Member Vice President Jones said, because we were, I think they reached out to multiple board members mm -hmm. because they did ask for that. So uh, can you outline what some of the steps are that the community members can take? I know I was able to forward your email to the Education Committee for the NAACP and a couple of other entities that are interested in legislative issues that yeah. directly impact CPS. And that's so a, what would some of the steps question. be? Good, thank you, and that's a great question. Because of the really short timeline that we're looking at right now, next, I would say seven to 10 to 14 days, I would recommend two, two avenues for communication. One is through your traditional state trade associations in Columbus. I know the superintendents have a group up there. I believe they've offered testimony already. Obviously, the State Board of Education, OSBA, OEA, and other education affiliated groups and association, I know are being engaged on this effort, presenting testimony, probably advocating their positions to individual members. That would be on a group-wide, statewide basis. In terms of our Hamill County delegation and CPS, I think if we want to get the word out, what our position might be, we should do it promptly and probably this week in some sort of communication, an email, whatever it might be, with the support of CPS, outlining our concerns and our, or our, our support of the bill, as it may be. There are parts of this bill that might seem favorable to some groups, other ones that may not like it at all. So we have the opportunity to communicate directly with our legislators, but the timeline is rather short. Eric, I'm gonna ask you, I know you've been on the other side. I do have one more question for you all. Do you, would it be would it be prudent to set up a meeting? I know we're kind of in the in the, the lame duck session, but amongst um, with the legislators and the people with the district, would that be prudent at this point within a quick window or no? They're going to be so I think so tied up in Columbus right now. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, getting time that might be tough. So I, I would just recommend that we, we send out emails to our elected, our delegation. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what the position is of, of the board. I did speak with um, Dan Hoying, who's mm -hmm. general counsel, and he had some thoughts about it, but I don't, I don't know if you have an official opinion, right. but whatever that might be, um, I would suggest that we prepare an email and we send it to our local delegation and then to President Huffman. And then I think we should probably send something over to the House just because it might get over to the House by Thursday. And then the House is meeting once next week, I think. Yeah, once next I was week. Thinking of virtual. I was thinking a virtual meeting. I wasn't thinking us physically <laughs> getting together. I was thinking like, can yeah, we Zoom yeah. together and be like, you know what, this is what we think? Yeah, so the, the problem is from a logistics standpoint, um, if we were to ask for a meeting on Tuesday, their calendars are booked Tuesday, mm -hmm. Wednesday, and Thursday because they're having meetings about how to move legislation or what legislation, and um, you know, people are wrapping up their careers sure frankly, and so it's, it's, it's a mess. So I think the best thing to do is to document where we stand. I think people will take note of it because we're one of the largest school districts in the state. And so I think we'll get, you know, we'll get attention. Uh, but I, I think trying to squeeze a meeting in now would, would be tough. I would agree with you on that the meeting probably would be too soon to happen. Um, I want to definitely take this back to the full board and talk with them to see um, about getting a stand and then also talking with Dan to see if it is the will of the board to come up with some type of statement. Yes. Yes. Um, just speaking um, to this group, uh, advocacy group, this coalition, the honesty Honesty for Ohio Education. I, there, I do have a contact. They were actually asking if we wanted to have a designated board member to, to perhaps participate with the coalition because they already 
they are already advocating up there. So there might be a way to link us in once we have a conversation with the board. But I think um, having a conversation with that person might be. Can that be shared with us? Yeah. What, what do you want? The the article? Or what do you want? Um, whatever it is that they want it oh, to okay. come from us. Maybe Phyllis or Pat can send that to us. It would be yeah. great. If okay. I could add one more suggestion. Yes. In addition to working through your state trade associations and working through us and your local delegation, once you develop a position, if you develop that position that you want to articulate to the public, it's always helpful to perhaps make key phone calls or have key communications with key members of a delegation on the phone, if you will, just to reemphasize the point that those of you who may have a personal relationship with certain members of our delegation, Democrat or Republican, House or Senate, you should feel free to reach out and have that conversation, at least on the telephone. At this point, personal contact should not be undervalued. Oh, right. So uh, there, there has only been proponent testimony on this bill so far. None of the big eight have, have put anything out publicly about it um, in terms of sending it to the committee. So if you were to make that decision, you, you, would, um, you would be the first, which is good. We usually are the first, so it's pretty good. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I think that is it. Do we have any other questions? Do you all have anything else to present to us? All right, great job. Thank you so much. We well, appreciate I, you. I, I will say one more thing. I can't wait till lame duck session is over. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. <laughs> I bet, I bet. All right, thank you guys so thank much. You. Next, we have a presentation on mental health and how our students are dealing with the increased amount of stress. And uh, we will be discussing some resources that are being made available to them. And um, the words will ask any questions or comments. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for be, uh, for inviting me to come and really appreciate the committee's support of mental health and wellness in general and the superintendents and Ms. Brazos support as well. Okay, go ahead and do the next slide, please. Um, so just to kind of, when I was here last, we went over in detail this, but just to kind of ground this, I included the mission of mind peace and the key focus areas. So we keep working on the whole system of care for mental health for our children, teens, and we have been doing some work in the young adult area because we've noticed that as kids are graduating, they're really struggling uh, to find mental health care and there should be that kind of continuum, I think. Um, so we work in, you know, multiple areas. We do a large uh, majority of our work in the school-based mental health arena because that's such an important piece of the system. Um, we are a learning community, so everything has the lens of how do, how do we get better? You know, what, what does quality mean and how do we get better? Next. So just to kind of um, review the ways that MindPeace assists CPS, so we help to facilitate the um, network for mental health for community learning centers. We facilitate new partnerships that are uh, needed based on the community learning center model. Um, as I always say, you guys have, you know, sort of set the mark nationally on community learning centers and engagement of families and the community, and so we that's part of our values. Um, strengthen the school-based partnerships, so we help to make sure they're following processes, eliminate roadblocks, coordinate around outcomes and data analysis, provide some assistance around tools for success, and then coordinate quality improvement efforts. And the network is always talking as a, a community, like where are the problems, where are the challenges, where should we get better? And then the network decides as a whole where the focus should be. So there are conversations every year around that. Um, provide guidance around the mental health and wellness system, connect often to prevention and intervention resources, especially at the building level, because every building has different needs, and so if they have a specific need, we'll try to make sure that, you know, holes are filled with uh, important resources that are around the community. And then just, um, we also have connected to professional development needs that the district has needed, 
A big thing is building capacity for the system, um, which we have a workforce shortage. So that has been a key issue. Um, and then providing community crisis response and support efforts. So um, the, the community has standardized, the, for instance, the way that kids are assessed if they have suicidal thoughts. And everyone is trained in the Columbia, it's called the suicide assessment. Um, their trainings provided for free um, for uh, all the school social workers, school psychologists, all the therapists. Uh, it's the same that the hospitals use. So everyone's talking the same language. And then people are sometimes really kind of uncomfortable about safety planning. If someone is feeling suicidal, how do I make sure they're safe? And so we set up training around that to build the capacity of so people are feeling more confident and comfortable that they have the skills. Um, we also have an annual mental health um, education summit where we bring all the teams in to learn from each other. So for instance, like this past summer, Ethel Taylor was one of the teams that was highlighted because of all the work that they're doing um, with just building their own system of care. They, they've been doing a really great job this past year on that front. So these are the, the lead mental health partners for CPS. These are the mental health partners that are part of the network. Um, and the network itself is open, so it's not a closed group. And I'm always looking for new organizations that help, can help increase the capacity for us. And so sometimes we've actually, like um, Poppy's Therapeutic Corner is a newer addition to our network. And one of the LSDMCs had heard of them and brought them to um, the school and then MindPeace. And then they learned about what the network required, you know, what the framework is. And MindPeace provided technical assistance to them and they decided they'd like to join and they're just doing great. So um, UMADOP just joined this past year. Um, again, we learned that through a school. Um, Douglas was looking at where can they get help and they were providing some prevention work and they were thinking, well, we have mental health in the office, don't do school-based, maybe we could. So met with them, talked about the model, they agreed to it, provided technical assistance, and now they're doing wonderful work at CPS. So if anyone hears of any mental health organizations that are not part of the network but would like to be, we want them to be part of the network. So. Next slide. Um, we're, we've got 71, through those mental health organizations, there are 71 full-time co-located therapists um, through those partnerships. And then every school has access to medication management through either it's on-site with typically either a nurse practitioner who specializes in psychiatry or a board-certified child psychiatrist. In a few instances, we have uh, pediatricians who specialize in mental health who come to the schools. Sometimes we do it via telehealth. Um, so the parent may either come to the school because it's more convenient and then talk to the a medical provider through telehealth. Or sometimes the medical provider is using telehealth because it's more convenient for the parent maybe because of work um, or whatever is happening in their lives that they have barriers. So it's a way to engage parents more in the medication management process. And then um, we have uh, care coordinators on site. I don't have the number today, but I'm gonna work to get that so that for the next time I give an update, you can get the full scale of not just therapists, but care coordinators, and then also medication management team who are on site providing access to care. And of course, everything is done with guardian consent and we want their participation, so engaging them. Next slide. Um, so the effects of the workforce shortage. So uh, we, it's still across the region a very significant issue. It's better than last year. Um, we had about 190 openings across the system last year. This year, it's about 150 uh, openings of therapists, and that's across multiple, it's across uh, hospitalization, um, partial hospitalization, office, school-based therapy. Um, so it's across all those pieces of the system. 
uh, and it's across for school-based multiple school districts, 24 school districts. Um, so at CPS, AMI um, has a partner in place, but we don't have a therapist. So that partner is trying uh, very hard to hire a therapist. Ethel Taylor has no partner. They went through the needs assessment that went out, and now I'm talking to mental health partners to see who's interested in interviewing. I hope to have interviews that can happen in the next two or three weeks. Uh, Rising Stars, the preschool, um, they do not have a partner in place. We are reassessing whether therapists on site really for treatment is kind of the best solution or whether we should be looking at intervention and prevention and working in, in conjunction with the social workers. So um, we've tried for three years different ways to provide access to mental health and wellness in the preschool environment and had learnings in all three years. And it's like not quite the right fit. So I've got some meetings set up with um, Dr. Cami Hill, who is the school psychologist who leads that effort and we'll see what we come up with. They right now, if kids have the need in Rising Stars though, they're sending referrals to MindPeace and MindPeace is working to find each individual family access to treatment for that family. Um, Rothenberg, there's no partner uh, currently. The interviewing is in, process, is in process and I think we actually have one. They're having a meeting this week to decide, so fingers crossed. Uh, Taft Elementary, uh, they have a partner, but they're hiring a therapist and another therapist is covering. So we've got um, five schools uh, that have shortages that are affected out of all of the schools. Um, so what we're doing is MindPeace coordinates with everyone to try to make sure we can find either the partner or how do we reach out and find different ways to hire that therapist. So for instance, sometimes in the schools, um, the school team is actually taking the opening and they're networking in their own networks. So like if they, if they belong to a professional society, if they belong to, you know, if they have people that they're friends with, they're professional, they're sending out. And we've had luck last year actually finding some therapists that way. Um, the mental health organizations uh, have recruitment bonuses. They're advertising across the state. Uh, one of them is advertising. Uh, advertising in multiple states, just doing whatever they can to try to bring people into Cincinnati versus stealing from each other. That doesn't really help us, you know? Um, so those efforts are underway. And then as a safety net, MindPeace last year started what's called an automated referral process. So if there's a wait list, then the school will say, we've got a wait list, we need help. And we have this, um, HIPAA compliant and FERPA compliant software system that says, okay, if you ask the parent, would you like to work with MindPeace individually, that family is referred to us, we assign a staff member to help, and then we contact families individually, find out what their needs are specifically, what their barriers are, and then we actually call everywhere to find a family, I mean, find a provider that will fit their needs. I've had instances where, because I also assigned myself to schools, where like a mom, uh, she had had surgery. She was uh, basically house ridden. She couldn't get anywhere to go. So I had to find an intensive home-based therapist that could come in and work with her young son and for it to be convenient for them. So I called around and was able to find that. Then I called the mom back. She called right away. They got connected to care. And so now her son and getting home base, turns out she needed some help too. So connected her with another therapist that an adult serving therapist who could help because she just had a lot on her plate. So uh, this year we already have, um, I think there are maybe 12 schools, CPS schools that are we are helping with, with, you know, just whether it's some kind of a wait list, whether it's these schools or you know, their capacity has gotten a little, you know, they already have maybe two therapists, but they've got 10 kids on a wait list. I don't want any children to be on a wait list and not have access to care. So that's a safety net that we put in place. And um, we were able to find care last year for every single family. There's capacity in our city for care. It's just sometimes not school-based and that's okay. 
Um, and then if, uh, when a therapist, not if, but when the therapist is hired and capacity goes back up for school, the family can choose to change if they want, or they can keep going. So that's the system we have in place, which is really different and unusual. We have the database for all the mental health providers in greater Cincinnati that we keep updated. Children's Hospital asked us to take that over a few years ago. And so that has really, I didn't realize like what a great asset that would end up being because we just use our database and then make all the calls and connect kids to care. So it's those hopefully in the next month or so, and then we'll move on, so. Um, next slide. So how are we doing just real quickly? Um, so I'm very happy the referrals have rebounded from COVID. So, you know, it was really, you know, difficult during that period. You can see that we had uh, 2,991 referrals last school year. Uh, 571 of the kids were also referred to medication management. Next slide. And then this is a look at the historical data. We can see now that the access to treatment is going back and increasing. So 2,858 students received school-based mental health. And the thing that I really like is even in a workforce crisis, they were able to maintain the amount of treatment that was happening. So it didn't, sometimes you would expect that treatment to go down. Because it's really not great. What if it dropped to like five hours, you know? So that's good news and access to care, even in the midst of all of this, and this is without the connection with MindPeace, that safety net that I talked about, 72% of kids at CPS had access to care. We know in Ohio now that it's running about 48% of kids get access to care. It's not good enough, we know that, but it's certainly better than the national average of under 50% and then the Ohio average. So we'll keep working on that. Next slide. And then these are the kinds of barriers. So wait list accounted for the 21% of the barriers. Um, that's when we instituted the, the mind piece <laughs> referral system. Um, the other piece, unable to reach or total decline or no show. To me, that's all around engagement for families. And so, at 12% last year, the, the ability to identify what, whether that's self-referring, parents referring, students receiving, or school staff refer referring. So 8% of students receive treatment. And are you okay, Carolyn? Yeah. And 4% um, of kids had barriers to treatment. And then we saw the details of those barriers in the other slide. So some of that was waitlist and a lot of it was parent engagement. Next slide. Uh, and then also your partners provided a lot of prevention and intervention services that were part of the of the process of their partnership. So there was no funding provided really for this service. Um, and these it comes in different ways. Like some some has been in the past like group prevention services, parent education, um, uh, education for teachers consultation in the classroom, uh, coaching, those kinds of things, all around mental health. Next slide. And that's tier one and tier two. Um, so this is, you know, the effects of the pandemic, some of the newer data since I've seen you last. Um, and it's, as we all know, you know, you know that, uh, you know, it's just uh, not, it's just not good nationally. So that after the pandemic now, just about 60% of youth that have major depression do not receive treatment. Just unacceptable. Uh, nationally, 28% of youth with severe depression receive consistent treatment. Do so you notice they say seven to 25 visits per year and we were seeing on the hourly rate, like I think it was 24 hours. So we're at the very high end of consistent treatment, which is really, uh, it's, good, it's a good benchmark. Next slide. So for us specifically, we continue. Unfortunately, I keep, I'm an optimist, so I keep thinking, oh, we're over this. <laughs> well, no, not exactly. Still the accumulative effects are happening. Uh, we see still a very high number of 
uh, students, families, staff dealing with grief and loss or trauma or, you know, just the tiredness of everything. Um, we have an increase in suicides um, across all ages in the state. Um, Ohio uh, recently, well, last month, uh, actually enlisted the support of the CDC because the number of suicides across all ages have increased. And so the CDC deployed a team in November to Columbus. They interviewed um, a deep dive into six counties. Hamilton and Butler were two of the six counties. They're doing surveys across the entire state this month. And then the CDC will be making recommendations for um, the uh, state in January. I really appreciate the work that um, the discussions and work that we're doing with Superintendent Wright and with Ms. Brazo around just continuing to make sure that people understand the mental health crisis number, the 988 number, the fact that CPS has an amazing employee assistance program for their staff. It is a great way to seek help. And then just making sure families know that there's support and that they can do things to help get through this period. So we've been working a lot on different ideas and resources around that. So I really appreciate it. Um, then the third, we talked about the workforce crisis and then there are financial pressures facing the whole mental health system, unfortunately. A lot of advocacy in that effort. Next slide. I think this is the last slide. So these are our opportunities, the integration. Again, I really appreciate the work with all the social workers that are on site. They are doing amazing work. The school um, psychologists, the PBIS team that CPS leads, and um, just the collaboration that happens between, you know, here we have community and school and working together to leverage as many resources as possible. It's a really deep partnership and really appreciate it. And then we've been looking at um, just connecting around the needs of each school, especially like grief and loss. Such a, it's just a, it's probably one of the number one needs that we have. Um, the LGBTQ community of um, students and family members, to be honest, they're the highest risk as far as mental health and suicide. And we try to connect to resources in the city, but we could, you know, we need, really need to improve. Um, suicide prevention and trauma-informed care, other ways that we help to make sure that the school sites have resources that they need. And then we also, because we're a learning community, we have a quality improvement um, effort going on that CPS is part of, and it's around hospital transitions. So when a child is a, has a hospital, a psychiatric hospitalization, and they transition back to school, how can that be better? Because it's just not good enough right now. So what can we all do? And so uh, CPS is uh, a member along with uh, six other school districts in the region, um, three divisions of Children's Hospital, and then um, we have five mental health organizations that are also members. So we're doing some really neat work. Your, your folks are representing CPS well. Um, and then we have some advocacy efforts that are really important happening with the workforce pipeline and the financial challenges. And we may need your help on that front, although I think we have other advocacy efforts that are probably needed sooner. <laughs> so those, that's uh, my presentation. Do you have any questions or anything that I can um, help with? Thank you so much. I do have a couple of questions. So from what I gather, we have five schools that have shortages. Yes. Um, you said that the barriers were, the top two were unable to reach families and a wait list. And then you were talking about some preventive services as well. Before I open it up to my colleague, I'm gonna go ahead and ask, I think I have about four questions. Okay. So my very first question is on slide, um, let me find my notes, on slide three, if you could pull that slide back up. Um, you're sharing the ways that MindPeace assists CPS. And then I guess my question to you is with all of the opportunities, what is the data that's being given from that? Um, do you have any data that can be shared to showcase how effective um, or ways that we can improve? So I think when you go to slide three here, it shows, for example, how you facilitate new school-based mental health partnerships, you're Back strengthening school-based mental health, providing yeah. guidance about school yeah. mental health. How are you measuring that? And so my question would be, how are we able to see the data coming from those particular 
Um, yeah. Instances. So that's a good. So at every school building, we have referral meetings where we look at how many refer how many kids are need help, and then what's happening to those referrals, and what are the barriers, and that's on a monthly basis. Um, so each team has data around around that, and so MindPiece could put that we. We don't track that as a whole until we get to it annually, but we could start if it would be helpful to the board, um, taking a look at sites and then passing that information along to the superintendent who can then get that to you all. Um, we look at just, uh, we look at the numbers of um, suicide assessments that are being done at each school site. Um, that's being tracked now. And we also then ask the mental health provider to provide a report card of you know of how they are doing and they usually include like whatever the evidence-based tool that they use for treatment because there's not there there are many depending on what kind of uh, brain disorder a child has but um, often they'll use like the strengths and difficulties questionnaire or they'll use the uh, Ohio scales as an example and then they provide that information to the school is it you know is is it getting better or not in total, not by student, because that would not that would not be okay from a HIPAA perspective, but in total, say I'm seeing 24 children, are they getting better functionally, you know? Um, and we, I also have a project going on right now to look at data, like are, how are we impacting the actual academics? Mm -hmm. So is attendance, improving or our behaviors improving and so we had this really interesting thing happen where sort of like sometimes in the face of a problem an opportunity comes so two years ago we had a school site that had no mental health partner and then the next year they got a mental health partner hired therapist quickly that was lucky and and so now we have like these two years of data of a high need school where we have no mental health partner and then we have a mental health partner and we can see like of the students that stayed you know without their names did attendance improve did behavior improve and so on so uh, i've got a um, phd student that's analyzing the, the data right now so i'd love to be able to you know so talk you do about have that. that data well that for one school site yeah okay yeah so then my follow-up question with that would be in terms of why i'm asking the question about the yeah. data is for example do we know what grade levels utilize the services most um, what schools have the top needs different things like that and wanting to know what are the families or how do they feel um have, has a survey been done to ask them you know are you appreciative of the services that are being provided to your child yeah. are there any ways to improve that is, I think, what I mean a little bit more about yeah, the data and, that you have. Yeah, and each of the mental health partners, they do that. They have okay. a satisfaction survey. They have, the, like I said, these other tools that they okay. use. The problem here is we're trying to figure this out, <coughs> and I asked Children's Hospital if they could help us figure this out. Not everybody uses the same tools. So to aggregate the data is can be difficult. There should be a way around that, like to right. keep the evidence, like to keep it valid data um, to be able to take it and are there commonalities and can we take those answers, for instance, and say across the board, this is what it looks like. So that's the work that we started last year was how can we do that? But we could ask individually for schools because every school is supposed to get a quality report card from their mental health partner that talks about those very specific items. How is the satisfaction of families going, you know? I can give you a report on the highest need schools, uh, who's like accessing more. Mm -hmm. That I can I can analyze that for sure and get, as a follow up, get some information to you all if that would be yeah, helpful. I think that would be great. And I have yeah. one last question. Sure. On slide 12, I think you provided numbers from the national standpoint. Yeah. Do you have actual CPS numbers of our students to actually say how many students have, whether it has been affected by suicide, whether it has been affected by some other category within mental health. Do you have those actual numbers instead of the the big, big, bigger picture? So we do have some some numbers from before, especially with the work that the Marison Denner, uh, Center did with uh, ACEs and and what how those are affected. So I can try to gather that information to make it CPS relevant so you can see that and I'd be glad to put that together yes, for you. Yes, I'm curious to see how it's affecting our students yeah, within CPS. Exactly. Yeah. So.
All right, and I'll gonna... bring this up to the network too and talk about it and see what we can do. Thank you. Work. Yep. I'm gonna open it up to my colleagues. Any other questions, Carolyn? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. I don't know how many months ago, but yeah. Um, and the superintendent was, I think that may have been like your first meeting <laughs> here in this committee. And um, we talked about the possibility of doing some work together, coordinating some efforts around accessing the data. So some of the data points that Mary is referencing, I'm wondering if there are ways to cross check with the district, such as things like attendance and who's utilizing the services, um, what is the impact of the services, how, you know, are there ways that we can find out or determine the impact overall? And I do think that that's probably going to take more of a coordinated effort with between my piece and district administration. So I would hope that, you know, that's one of the suggestions that I will have if we could push that a little bit. And I know it's a little time consuming because we've never done it like that before. So yeah. it's fairly new, but I think it would be helpful to not only the district, but to my piece for, for the work that you do as well. Oh, it's the question that has to be answered. I mean, it's great yeah. to talk about inputs to the system, how many kids are served, because that is kind of a critical item right. right now with so many kids not being served. But really, that's not the the focus of the work. The focus is how are right. kids doing and is it making is, are their lives better? Are they doing better at school? Mm -hmm. This one case study that I have is sort of showing us like how difficult it is or not to get the data and like to analyze the data. So yeah. I'm going to follow up if it's okay with Superintendent Wright on that. Um, I'm supposed to get kind of the analysis in a couple weeks of how, you know, how it's going and so on. And we can say like if you were going to expand it, what could that look like and how much easier would it be? So, yeah. Thank I think you. Board Member Jones has one more question. Then don't worry about it. it, it are you sure? Left my brain. Oh, no. You are <laughs> fixed. You. <laughs> so I it's have okay. Questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just think of the one more thing. Thank you, uh, Susan. Just to reference as well the conversation around suicide, um, because when we met, we talked quite a bit about that, and we know that the holidays is not a positive time for everyone. Uh, so we will be sending out to all of our our, our parents and our staff. Uh, just information around um, the you know, just suicide, suicide awareness, where you can get help. A lot of times the <clears throat> school location is the place where they would go to get help. And if stu schools aren't in over a period of time, that's problematic. And the second thing I think as we begin to have that conversation, because there is not one, uh, we would also have to look at a dashboard, a protocol joint space, because there is, to, to Susan's point, um, everyone is using their own information. So I think that as we are, you know, continuing the conversations around information and how to make sure that we're looking at outcomes, that's one of the things that we look at. And lastly, I did want to also introduce who Susan has been working with, uh, Kelly Brazo, who is our new director. If you'll stand welcome. for one second so the Health and Safety Committee welcome, can see Welcome, welcome. Uh, Thank who you is for our being new here. director of Positive School Culture, who uh, oversees this work as well. <laughs> All right, Board I, Member Jones, she I'm remembered sorry, her I question. Remember. It's okay. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> and Susan, this question <laughs> is as old as I am, but um, <laughs> so is it still the, the sort of the um, sort of an assumption that all the kids who are coming through for the services based in the um, schools are Medicaid eligible? And if not, mm -hmm. does MindPeace help those who may have private insurance or is the district helping those who have private insurance to access services? Are they able to access the same services? Yeah, so the goal um, for the framework is that all kids can be served no matter their payer source. That's the goal. Um, the reality is that not everybody, not all the providers can take private insurance, but many, many do. Um, so the addition, for instance, of like you know, Children's Hospital as a partner to some of the schools has been really helpful because they push the insurance companies to accept other providers. You know, that's really been helpful. 
um, some of our, uh, like one of the two new uh, mental health organizations, Poppies, they accept private insurance, which is fantastic. Best Point accepts many private insurance. So we've really worked in the last like, you know, eight years to try to increase the capacity. Because so many of our families, if they don't qualify for Medicaid, they, they're doing, they're like, they're really doing well, you know, with their trying to remove barriers in their lives and then their the private insurance is not affordable for care right. and they don't qualify for medicaid which is you know just so <clears throat> difficult so yes we really we're working on that we're working on advocacy to increase to encourage insurance companies to increase their rates i mean it, private insurance pays less than medicaid that's why we don't have as much capacity that's the plain and simple truth of it so, um, so we keep trying to work on the advocacy and add mental health organizations who do accept private insurance as a choice. So our schools where we have a lower mix of, or a different mix of private and public insurance that we can serve all those families. And if they can't, then they refer to MindPeace and we find somebody who will, so. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Board Member Moffitt. So thank you for the presentation. Uh, sure. I'm very, very interested in this and have done a little bit of research. I'm taking the uh, medical, the mental health first aid uh, certification. Oh, great. Uh, for, for young, for children. And so Congratulations. Um, thank you. working on that. Yeah. yeah. But this is a particular interest for the community yeah. around our social and emotional support for our young people, for our students and our staff. But we're just going to focus on the students in this yeah. conversation. And so um, I do. I do have a couple of questions um, to that end. You mentioned the annual education summit with kids, with, which I'm super excited about to, uh, finding some data. So when you do come back to yeah. present, if you wouldn't mind giving us some information about that from the young people's perspective, I'm really, really big on youth voice and big on um, hearing from them about how we can better service them. And one of the things that almost every single time whenever we've heard them speak, they would love men more mental health support at varying levels. Individually is what it sounds like you're speaking of um, with regard to my piece, but I have another question around group uh, support mm -hmm. for young people. Are we able to offer uh, any type of group therapy sessions for um, particularly our teens, but maybe utilizing ESSER funds or utilizing some other monies that are available for the, um, for, for therapy, but not in the traditional sense. Can we think, a and I've, I've always, I've said this to our administration as well, we need to think a little bit more creatively, if possible, yeah. regarding funding, because funding will continually be a challenge, but do you offer any type of group therapy sessions currently? And then I have some other questions. Yeah, so um, CPS's school social workers are doing a fabulous job providing groups. Um, and then we also, for experts like in grief and loss, uh, there are three organizations in Cincinnati with really strong uh, grief and loss backgrounds who will come in and we we help coordinate with the resource coordinators to set up those groups, which is great. Um, for treatment groups, um, you know, I think it would be nice if there were more funding is, you know, can be challenging. So if there are ESRA funds that can be you know, uh, provided so that the mental health organizations could do more. They, I think they would really uh, love to talk about that, sure. you know? Yeah, sure. I think they would be very open to more creative solutions to meet the family's needs. And it would be great partnerships when, you know, they're, they're really, their financial model is, is, really, is really difficult right now. And uh, a lot of the mental health partners are losing money when they provide services. And so um, thinking about ways to use their expertise and then be able to use funding that might be available would be really helpful. Okay, and I'm definitely familiar with our grief, um, with our grief and loss, but I but I'm was specifically speaking towards the mental health therapy. Like yeah. We get some group therapy yeah. there. Um, I do, I am aware of a group of minority providers, so I will be sending them your, your way. And uh, they, they, again, as you know, um, Poppy and the, the other one that you mentioned, you would up, they, they are being stretched rather thin right yeah, about now because exactly. the need far outweighs the, the, um, what we have. And there, well, we're also, I think a lot of the mental health organizations are trying, because some of them aren't um, 
you know, they're not uh, owned by uh, people of color, but they're they're man they're nonprofits whose managers, directors, presidents are you know they're trying to become more diverse, which is needed. You know, sure. so we that I did not represent that in the in the uh, slide, but we do have you know some really strong people that are directors or that are vice presidents or CEOs in your organizations that you're partnered with. So I just wanted sure. to make sure you knew. But please, cop, if you could send me their contacts, oh my gosh, I'd absolutely. follow up too. So. I absolutely will. I, I was just <laughs> sitting here thinking, trying to do that and not be distracted because I, I'm very familiar with quite a few. Yeah. Um, uh, is there, okay, you mentioned the partnership with regard to Children's Hospital. Another question that I have is, do you happen to have any data on our <coughs> ESL student population and regarding mental health services mm -hmm. provided and desired? Um, I know that we've got a, a Another, I think it's significant, mm -hmm. homeless population, ESL population, that um, do we happen to have providers that are multilingual? Um, you know, what is that, what is the need yeah. for that demographic? So um, we have an, an, an increasing need of students um, where English is a second language uh, across our city and at CPS. Um, there are, uh, challenges because some of the students who are not citizens do not qualify for any health care. So we have real difficulty in figuring out how to get them mental health care. And there isn't right now another funding source for safety net. It used to be that the United Way funded a safety net for these students and we had a, um, a partnership, a mental health partnership specifically with bilingual therapists who would come in in addition to your lead and provide for those, say, like, you know, 20, 30, 40 students who are, who's, you know, who were, who did not qualify for any services. Um, so that is not available right now. DPS was really wonderful in the last two years for cert, a couple, some of the schools where we have a high number of those children provided some dollars in order for the mental health provider to have a bilingual therapist and provide services to those students. It's approved by the principal, so there's a system of you know how those referrals get made and so on. But it is a challenge and one that I've talked with the state about and other local county officials because we really need to get funding um, because these kids need care, you know. And uh, it's such a great question that you've asked. We're trying to you know provide uh, resources and get them help, but it would be so much better if the mental health partner could provide the resources right there in the school. There are some um, that do have bilingual therapists in the school, so like AMI would be an example of having a Spanish-speaking therapist right there at the school, but we'd love to have more. There just that aren't as many out there. So, sure. so yeah. I wanna understand, because I'm gonna definitely be, uh, look. we're looking at the budget today, and I'm gonna uh, challenge the administration and the treasurer to uh, rectify that. I want to understand there is not currently funding for our ESL students to have mental health services that is covered by the district. Is that right? So just to kind of back up, okay. so ESL students who are not kids who are not citizens of the, of the country, they do not qualify for Medicaid. So those children do not have services per se from the mental health partner, but the district has made funding available for um, Western Hills High School and Dater High School kids who we have a large population there. For, so there is funding for those, has been at least in the last two years, which has been really helpful. So the district has been forward thinking and made funding available. I, I don't, you know, it may be, I don't know if we need more or not, that's for well, I just, I just everybody wanna, to I just- think my I think my question is to see if we have a gap and if, yeah. our, if our ESL students are not, if they do not have insurance, yeah, and it's not just the ESL students, but if they don't have insurance, are we able, are they getting services? Not all of them are getting okay. services. That answers my question. Yeah. Thank you. And, and then my, let me see. Um, board member Weinberg asked about the greatest needs First, like what are you finding as the greatest needs? And you you said that you were gonna come back and report that. So I'm looking forward to that. Okay, data. great. I'm actually, I'm probably gonna ask you the most questions about intersectionality. So I really am interested in the medical health prov um, provision and absenteeism and how it's a greatest impact on yeah. the things that are impacting learning. 
um, I think the superintendent can tell you, I always ask those types of questions. What is the impact of learning? It's a perfect question because, I mean, kids have to be ready to learn. So that's, to me, Absolutely. the mental health and the primary care uh, partnerships should be helping you guys have students that are ready to learn. Sure. Just one um, clarification on your que your statement question around the um, education. So the annual education day is for mental health uh, partners. So the people that attend, it's not students. It's like um, the, the social workers, counselors, psychologists, the therapists, and okay. all this. But we are launching this year in February the first family education day for parents and teenagers who have depression. Yeah. And so that'll be in February. We'll offer scholarships, so there should be no barrier for people. Lunch, breakfast provided. They'll learn about uh, treatment, medicine, holistic care, and be able to really like get help. So that's in February. I'll let, I'll make sure you guys know because I'm yeah, so definitely. excited about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for caring about mental health mm -hmm. so deeply. Thank like, you. This is Thank very you. exciting. I really appreciate the questions because that will help me also with our mental health partners. This is needed. We have we have to move faster. I think we have one question from Superintendent Wright. Oh, sure. I do, I do so that I can also be prepared for the next question from my board member. If you will also provide as you're working with the partners, um, the the actual ELL students that are not that are currently being referred that are not getting care so that we will know exactly who we're working with and yeah. we're able to look at that gap. Sounds good. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Right. Thank you so much. Any other questions? I think great job. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. All righty. It was a pleasure. Okay, we're going to move right along here and we are moving into our recap of the year and providing a quick discussion on health and safety and really just summarizing all of the great things that this committee has done for the year. Um, as the chair, I've had the opportunity to just come in and learn so much and of course to work alongside two of my great colleagues and also our hardworking superintendent as well. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking about health and safety a little bit later on at another board meeting in terms of what we expect for next year. But really quick, and then I'll open it up to my colleagues to add in anything else. I'm just going to tell you all throughout the year, um, health and safety got the chance to adhere to their 2022 work plan that was, of course, accepted by this committee. The health and safety committee, um, we did a great job of being an advocate. We have committed to putting the safety physical, social, and emotional health of our students, our staff, and our partners at the forefront of everything that we do. So some of the topics that we discussed throughout the year consisted of child abuse prevention, bullying, sexual abuse, sexual discrimination, sexual harassment prevention, sexual orientation issues, resource coordinators and community learning centers, student code of conduct, nutrition, health, and of course, mental health. We also discussed pedestrian safety, safety in communities in which school um, facilities reside, and then, of course, in-school safety. So if I could just go through the quick list, uh, we started off when, with ensuring that moms demand action um, locally here. They were able to have a resolution presented to them and the ability to have their gun storage contract shared on our CPS website for parents and students to adhere to gun storage safety, and it served as edu education excuse me, and awareness. We also continue to be a voice for those who were concerned with updated School building and safety precautions, especially during these difficult times that the nation has gone through as it reflects on some of the school, the things that have been happening in schools. We also um, were updated, we updated the superintendent on any safety or health concerns that were brought to our attention and made aware of those situations that may have stemmed from community, students, staff, or et cetera. Um, there was also discussion of the protocol was clarified as it pertained to school lockdowns and lock-ins and improving transparent communication with parents. Um, another protocol was also clarified as it related to the safety of students while at school and if the student is injured, what is the correct protocol and how parents should be able to um, advocate for their children. We were also able to get great updates and next step plans and, um, you know, updates from our legislative liaisons on possible bills that would be possibly brought up at the state house or that could affect the CPS school district. And we made a push for all schools to have in place mental health partners, especially during the pandemic and now post-pandemic. And um, also, I'm proud of the Health and Safety Committee for staying up to date with COVID information throughout our weekly link that is that has been provided through um, administration and our superintendent. And um, I feel that we did a really good job. 
So I'm going to open it up to my colleagues if they want to add anything else that I may have left off. No one wants to say anything. <laughs> Dr. Moffitt, Board Member Jones. Yay. Okay. Well, I guess we did a great job so far. So now we're going to move on to new business. Um, I have a couple of things that I wanted to bring up in new business. And if you all have anything else that you'd like to add, um, you can let me know. The first thing that I wanted to ask, and this is for Superintendent Wright, um, regarding RSV, RSV, the respiratory. And, um, you know, we're getting around the winter months. A lot of our students and staff are coming down with the flu, things like that. I know we're still worried about COVID, but I feel like now I've been hearing so much about RSV. And I know Board Member Jones, you had mentioned something about that a couple meetings ago, I think. So I wanted to kind of ask, are there any, um, I guess, inside, or are we getting any data showcasing that this might be on an increase, or should we be on the lookout for that? Thank you. So the recommendations right now from the health department are to, are to continue just like you will with any other virus. Um, is to continue the cleaning protocols, making sure that you're looking at hygiene and what's happening in terms of hygiene, that you're looking at appropriate ways for, for students to, or individuals, period, um, to cough and, and those kinds of things. Um, we, there was, we have not had anything that's been confirmed for us. Um, so at this point, we, and we don't give anything in terms of confirmation before we get that information from the health department. And so I would say that we would continue to keep the board abreast if there are concerns that do arise, but in terms of cleaning the cleaning regimen, making sure that our schools are stocked with the appropriate cleaning materials, um, having wipes in the classroom, continuing to encourage students to use that. And of course, individuals that like to that would like to continue masking, we, we encourage them to do that as well. Okay, sounds great. I think the last question that I have is, can you give us an update? I know in one of the health and safety uh, committee meetings, uh, there was a complaint about updating doors of school buildings. And I think you're probably going to talk maybe a little bit about this later on in the board meeting, but I saw that it was in one of our uh, budget lines. So I wanted to know if you could just give a brief summary of um, an update on if that was able to occur. Obviously it has, but just providing some closure. Right. So in terms of the, the ask and the order, that particular part was done and, take, and taken care of. Um, there are still some installation processes that need to occur. Um, and there were some back orders as well, just because of the supply chain demand. So it is a work in progress. It, I'm working on. Oh, great. All right, opening it up to my other colleagues. Hopefully they have some other questions on new business or something to discuss. No new business? Oh God, you guys are really trying to get out of here. Well, I'm going to ask another question. Are you ready? Um, this is for new business, Superintendent Wright. I know that with health and safety, you are having a ride along coming up that you have um, put out there on social media. Wasn't quite sure about the details of it. So if you could just share a little bit more with whoever is listening or I guess any questions that we may have after you kind of explain a little bit more about it, we can ask. Sure, the ride along actually is in partnership with Metro. And so all of the information that was shared for the ride along is actually shared in um, the social media post that went out as well as what's put on the website and our web page for it. Uh, what we found, we will be talking about transportation tonight. And as you know, we've been talking about transportation quite a bit. Uh, we have identified, and I shared it with the board previously, we have identified about 478 students that their bus routes have been fairly consistently late. So since November, uh, those bus routes have been, you know, anywhere from 45 seconds late into some schools as much as 30 minutes late. And that's, this is Metro. This is, or you're just this is yellow general. buses. Okay. The issue with the, so, so that's for yellow buses. All of this is an attempt to try to get more students to school on time. Okay. So what we know is that we have a need for buses. We have a bus driver shortage. Uh, we have, and therefore we are, we are rerouting students. We have rerouted over 4,700 students from the beginning of the school year until now. And we're continuing to do that. Um, but we have to look at other ways that may be options for families. We did have about, about 1,100 families that opted to use Metro for their seventh and eighth grade students, and there may be others. And so if there are, uh, we want to give them the opportunity to do that. And one of the ways that we thought about doing that is 
um, giving them an opportunity to actually ride Metro. There may be some families that they've heard stories about Metro, mm -hmm. but they've not actually rode the bus. So in partnership with Metro, uh, we're offering the ride along for them. And that's any parent that goes to the bus on Thursday or Friday and says that they would like to ride, you know, for that day and they're a CPS parent, they're allowing them to do that. What are the dates and the time would be obviously whatever time the child the is The date going. is the time that the parent and child actually go. Mm -hmm. So it could actually be after school hours. Okay. Of course, you know, that would really be up to the parent, but it's Thursday and Friday, the 8th and 9th. 8th and 9th? Seven, eight, nine, okay. Yeah, the 8th and 9th. Mm -hmm. That might be it. Yep. I've just had some parents ask questions about it, logistically speaking. I, I wish we had known about it a little earlier because I think I would have been more prepared to ask to answer those questions, but um, questions that I've gotten are, how do we get on the bus with, you know, how do, how do we get identified to go back home? If we say we're a CPS parent, do we need anything? If we ride the bus with our child to go to school and we wanna go back home, what, what's the identification? Um, that's needed. Do I need to carry my students past? I said, I, I really don't know. Um, how is there, what is the end game of that? Is that just to increase ridership of seventh and eighth grade students from the yellow bus to Metro? And, yes. And yes. So this was born out of the joint meeting that was a follow up to the joint meeting that occurred with um, our uh, council and the board. So the, one of the follow-up meetings to that was a meeting with Metro, SORTA, and a board representative. And from that, we had already launched for parents the opening of them to ride Metro. We, if, if, if everyone recalls, previously, when we gave the seventh and eighth grade students the opportunity to ride Metro for the first semester, there was a day certain that we needed to know by. So as we're getting ready to end the first semester on December 16th, we wanted to open for students to and parents to give us feedback as to whether or not they wanted to ride for the second semester. So we had already put that information out to families about letting us know if they wanted to ride for the second semester um, for transportation. After that, one of the questions that came up, um, and I don't recall where it was from, it may have been from feedback that had been provided by someone else, but that there were some parents that were concerned about riding the Metro or their seventh or eighth grade child riding the Metro. So in a way to give them an opportunity as an option, it is not a given, it is just an option for them to actually ride the bus as well. What Metro has shared with us is the parents only need to say that they are a CPS parent. There isn't anything else they need. They didn't give us any cards to give them. They don't need their child's ID. It was just them being able to ride to school with the student. And if they choose to ride back on the bus, they're able to do that. So I do offer apology to the board for not giving you the information ahead of time. Um, but I, I, I think that we shared the information so that we are trying to encourage it, as many students or families as possible to have other options because we know that we're consistently hearing about the buses that are late. We cannot, we're doing everything that we can to control that. We have a shortage. The, be, the best way for us to try to reduce the number of students that are late is the number of students that are, have other options for that. Then that allows us to reroute and then utilize those buses more efficiently. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, we've come to the last part of the meeting. Rob, do we have anyone signed up to speak? I was thinking we would have like 10 people. Well, thank you everyone so much for your time and your commitment and your hard work and dedication. And with no other business, this meeting is a, you thank all can run.